Hey, everybody. Do you ever wish that you had a shortcut to making quick and easy dinners with just a handful of ingredients straight from your pantry? I always have a freezer full of vegetables and brown rice, but making a sauce at the end of a long day can be exhausting and frankly is the straw that breaks the camel's back. And bottled sauces at the grocery store, they're loaded with oil, sugar, and all kinds of nonsense. And it's like pouring motor oil all over your beautiful meal that you've created. Well, today I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Plan Strong's all new, just launched secret sauce mix. It is your secret weapon for quick and delicious dinners that everyone in the family will adore. Our first secret sauce is an organic peanut curry mix. And it's specially formulated to make a creamy, dreamy sauce that will make you want to lick the bowl clean. The secret is its base. We've used a powdered defatted peanut butter with lots of body, and you just whisk it up to make this delicious sauce. Now to boot, its warm spices give a depth and complexity that's really spectacular. And having this secret weapon in your pantry will guarantee that you never grow bored with just brown rice and broccoli. You can use it as a salad dressing, a warm grain bowl topper, a dipping sauce, or as a simmer sauce for absolutely any meal. My favorite way to enjoy it is by throwing a bag of frozen rice in the microwave. Then I toss a bag of frozen vegetables along with a cut up brick of tofu in a warm skillet. And while that's doing its thing, I'll mix the peanut curry sauce packet with one cup of water and stir that up. Then I pour the sauce into the skillet with the veggies and the tofu until it's hot and starts to bubble. And then I serve it over the brown rice. And now you've got a delicious Plant Strong meal. Just visit plantstrongfoods.com to pick up a six pack of this all new secret weapon for your Plant Strong pantry. Go peanut curry mix. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plan Strong Podcast. The mission at Plan Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. My guest today has a fascinating backstory and one that is super inspiring. Nisha Vora was raised in a traditional vegetarian Indian household, went to undergraduate at California Berkeley, Harvard Law School, and then worked as a corporate lawyer for a few years in the Big Apple, New York City. And it didn't take long for her to realize that this is not, not in any way what she wanted to do because as a young girl, she loved food and cooking. She was the girl who would watch cooking shows on TV and take cooking classes just for the fun of it. And as a corporate lawyer, she definitely didn't have time for cooking and she wasn't having any kind of fun. So in 2016, after binge watching food documentaries for a whole weekend, Nisha became fully plant-based and started a food blog as a side hustle called Rainbow Plant Life. Well, that side hustle has now become a full-time career as she teaches her 1 million plus YouTube subscribers how to be better cooks and consume fewer animals. In 2019, she released her first book, The Vegan Instant Pot Cookbook, Wholesome Indulgent Plant-Based Recipes, and that's what we dive into today. People are so intimidated by this wildly popular kitchen tool, and she breaks it down, teaches us how to start simple, and then shows us the magic that you can create with the Instant Pot. It definitely inspired me to finally get ours out of the box, and I hope it does the same for you today. Welcome 
Nisha Vora. Hey, Nisha, welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. Thanks so much for having me here, Rip. Yes, yes. You know, we have never met, have we? We have not. We haven't. Um, we should do something about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're sort of e-meeting today. We, uh, we, we are. Where are you located? Where am I talking? I am in San Diego, California. Uh-huh. Do you like San Diego? I do. I would say I used to live in New York City for a very long time. And so moving anywhere besides there is kind of a hard move because New York City is just like its own crazy, magical, unique place. And so I feel like I'm often comparing life to life in New York, which yeah. these are very different places. But overall, San Diego is a lovely, lovely place. Right. How long were you in New York City? Uh, eight years. Uh-huh. And is that when you were, were you a lawyer out of New York City or what were you doing? I was, yeah. I went to New York City straight after law school. Like a lot of my classmates worked at a big Wall Street law firm, which was terrible, <laughs> did a couple other things, and then eventually was like, I don't want to be a lawyer anymore. Let me figure out how I can navigate out of this world. <laughs> yeah. So let's just, let's jump in there because, you know, you went down, you, you say that, you know, you were kind of, you know, you were, you were studious. Mm -hmm. a student, a little nerdy. <laughs> and, um, you know, you traded in your 17, you know, magazine for the Bon Appetit magazines, <laughs> kind of love food. And you went down this career path. Um, you went to Harvard uh, Law School, right? Yep. And before that, were you at Berkeley? Where were you? Yep. Yep. Berkeley. Wow. So Berkeley to Harvard. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Right. And then you get, you land a, a job at a, I would imagine a pretty prestigious law firm. Yes. Yes. And you just hated the Dickens out of it. I, I did. So well, I kind of yeah. knew, you know, go ahead. Sorry. No. Yeah. I was gonna say, at what point did you know, like, this is just kind of eating at my soul and I can't stand this. Yeah. So the corporate job I took right after law school, I knew pretty much immediately. Uh, I didn't go to law school to become a corporate lawyer, but it did pay the bills very nicely in the first couple of years when you have lots of things to pay off and you're just trying to find your feet. And so I was like, I'm going to do this for a few years. It was terrible for many reasons. Like people just don't treat you like a valuable human being there. The work hours are crazy. The work itself is like you're defending large multinational, international corporations and banks who have clearly committed legal wrongdoings and are get, getting away with it. So it's like not inspiring work. Um, but then I quit after two years. I did some traveling, came back, and I was like, I'm going to start a legal career in a in a path that I know that I, I think I know what I want to do. I um, started working in the nonprofit space where I was um, representing low-income tenants in New York City, which was definitely more aligned with my values. And felt better, but after a while, it still felt like the same anxiety. You know, I'd wake up every morning anxious. I'm a morning person and I would be like, I don't want to wake up right now. I don't want to go to work. Like, and I was just coming home, and like just a, miserable, you know, it's not a good existence. It doesn't, it's not, you know, and you can do it for a short period of time, but after a while you're like, how long am I going to do this for? Is it two years? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? Can we go, let's go back for a sec. Yeah. You said you, you were two years with this law firm, um, uh, this big law firm. Have you ever seen the series that's on Netflix called Suits? I haven't, but I will say it's nothing like Suits <laughs> from what I have seen, like little glimpses of. Well, okay. All right. Well, just the, like you said, you, you weren't appreciated kind of the borderline ab abuse, you know, of these first year, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, law, what's it called? What do you call it? Associate. Associate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that go, ah, I just, I can't believe that goes on and that you aren't appreciated and people aren't, you know, lathering you with all kinds of, you know, praise and thank yous and stuff like that. It, it was more like, um, I didn't need to be uh, adorned with praise. It was more, uh, it would be nice for someone to say thank you once in a while. It would be nice just to be treated like I'm a person who has other obligations, yeah. who's not going to just like slave away at this place. And they pay you a lot. So I get 
that like they expect you to work a lot, but it was the combination of the work not being fulfilling, at least for me, uh, no one really being a very nice person <laughs> and yes. uh, the crazy hours, you know, you're expected to be available at all times, including weekends, including at 10 well, PM, if, if that's what it calls for. Well, that's the stereotype. Like you just said, it's like, you know, not very nice people, but you think that I just can't imagine that's how these people were. Do you think it's no, it, it changes this, you for sure. It, it, okay. So somehow this culture, it somehow like sucks the life and the soul and the energy out of you where you're just focused on, I guess what, making money and yeah. winning and, 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 and pleasing your boss. And, you know, I, I was like, I know that not everyone here was a bad person, right? Like there's probably lots of eager, lovely people and their souls kind of just got crushed over, over time. And I was like, I don't want that to be my life. Like um, well, I need to get out before that starts to happen to me. Yeah. And, how courageous of you to be able to make that move and know that I got to get out of this because most people, it seems they're probably just as unhappy. Would you? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And, and yet for whatever reason, they don't have the fortitude or whatever it is to, to make that leap. And so you made it to the kind of nonprofit mm -hmm. right? and then you were still not satisfied. And so at one point did you decide to make the leap and go into food? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. It sounds like you've loved since you were a little child. Yeah. Um, I would say within like a year of working at the nonprofit, I knew I was like, you know, I thought this was going to be the path for me. I wanted to go to law school to help people. And in a certain way I was, but I was also seeing how, I guess, disillusion, disillusioning the law, the legal system in the US can be like, there I was at this corporate law firm, very easy to get off big corporate wealthy actors scot-free for doing illegal things. And then there I was being a lawyer for low-income people where there were laws to protect them on the books, but so hard to enforce, so hard to get um, legal assistance for these folks who really needed it, you know, to stay in their homes, like one of the most fundamental, you know, things in your life. And I just got very disillusioned by how difficult it was to use the law to do good. Uh, and then there was just like the ordinary anxiety and stress and that kind of stuff of being a lawyer. And so about a year in, I was like, you know, I have to figure out what I want to do with my life that might be something very different. And I tried a couple of different things. Like I thought I wanted to go um, become a coder, like a programmer. I took some online courses. I was like, I don't think my brain's set up this way, you know, and then eventually I just got I think honest with myself. And I was like, I've always loved food. Why is that not something I'm thinking about? And I had started an Instagram account back around the same time, um, really just as a creative outlet to share what I was making. And I had gone 2016, 2016. And I went vegetarian around the same time. And so I was just like trying new things and it started to take off. And I was like, is this, can I turn this into a career? And uh, I started applying to food startups in New York city and eventually found a vegan food startup that was like, yeah, you seem, we, we could use someone eager and young who's willing to try new things. Uh, and so I started there at the beginning of 2017 doing basically like all different things, recipe development, recipe testing, food photography, social media, you know, just like had my hands in a lot of different was this, was this, was this a, uh, a CPG company? Um, yeah, it, it's called Hungry Root. They're still in business. They're not a vegan company anymore, but at the time they were. Uh, and then I was just building my own business as a side hustle on, like on the weekends and at night and the morning before work. And so when you say building your business as a side hustle, what did that business look like? Is that a blog? Was it Instagram? Was it? Yeah. I know, I know you, you now have built up your, your Facebook following you've got like, or your YouTube following, you've got over a million followers on YouTube. I mean, that's, that's serious. <laughs> yes. It didn't start off that way. <laughs> um, never I, no, it never does. I just started with an Instagram account at the beginning. And then eventually I was like, I'd like a place for my recipes to live. That's not just an account owned by Instagram. Uh, and so I started a blog where I started to put, you know, my recipes and write more about them. Like, this is how you should make it. Or here are some tips or substitutions and things like that. And then eventually I started a YouTube channel because I felt like I was learning so much about 
cooking and I forgot to mention I went vegan in 2016 and I was learning so much about vegan cooking and like the vegan lifestyle and all this new information that I was so excited about and felt like I want to share this with other people and I felt like I needed a video format to do that and so I started a YouTube channel but this was like early early on and I you know would film when I had time because I was working a full-time job so it wasn't like a serious endeavor at the, at the time right are um <clears throat> you said you went vegan 2017 I think you 16 said. 16 16 yeah um did you grow up as a vegetarian I did not. Uh, my parents are vegetarian, so they're from India, and they pretty much have always been vegetarian, grew up that way. Uh, but when they moved to America and my sister and I were born, I think they were just like, let's make their lives easier. You know, like, let us like let them do what they want kind of thing. So my mom, who cooked, only cooked vegetarian, mostly Indian food. But if we were like at lunch at school or after school, we could get like fast food and meat and all that kind of stuff. So I had a fairly dichotomous diet at home. It was like pretty wholesome Indian vegetarian food. And then when I was not at home, it was like a lot of processed food, a lot of fast food, a lot of junk food. Uh-huh. Okay. And why did you decide in 2016 then to make the, um, make the leap to vegan? Yeah. So I had stopped eating meat. I mentioned earlier, I had gone vegetarian at some point in 2016, mostly because I felt that when I ate meat, I felt a little weighed down, like a little sluggish, a little heavy, not like weight wise, just like, ugh, you know? And so I stopped eating it, started to feel more energized. And as I stopped eating meat, I was like, I should, you know, I'm doing this Instagram thing. I'm posting about my food. I should like learn more about where my food is coming from. And so one week, my partner who um, traveled a lot for work at the time went on a business trip. And I was like, this is my time to like watch all the things he doesn't like to watch, which are documentaries. <laughs> and so I've, I started watching Food Inc. one night, the documentary. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this is how we raise animals for food. And this is where food comes from. And so then the next three nights I watched, I think nine more documentaries, just like binge watch one after another. And when he came home, I was like, hey, I'm vegan now. And he was like, uh, what? Uh, He's like, I've been gone for four days. I was like, I know. <laughs> and a lot has changed in those four days. Wow. And what about your <clears throat> your parents? Uh, what, what, did, what did they think about or what did they think back then about you, you know, going going vegan? Any issues or are they supportive of that? Pretty easy, you know, because because they are vegetarian. So I think they're probably happy I stopped eating meat, but uh, I think in the, the few, first few months, I thought more, oh, she's on a diet. This is some, some new trend. She's She'll grow tired of it. And so like I would go over and my dad likes to make a lot of desserts and he'd be like, oh, have just a bite. It's it's okay. You can cheat. And I'm like, no, dad, it's not a diet. Like what, what I saw in those documentaries, what we do to animals, what animal agriculture does to the planet, I was just like, oh my God, I can't believe. I felt like this information was being hidden from me and I was like, so angry that I hadn't known all that before, but also so energized that now I did know that and I could like do something about it, at least in my own personal life. And so I was like, no dad, it's a lifestyle. It's not a diet, you know, like all those like talking points. Um, and you know, over to like a few months after the first few months, they were like, oh, we get it. Um, so it was never really that difficult. Now, the other thing <clears throat> with your parents that you had to like have a reckoning with maybe a little bit was you leaving you know, being a lawyer and everything, how you self-identified, because I'm, I'm sure there's a certain amount of esteem that mm -hmm. is, that is just bestowed upon you, especially mm -hmm. as a woman, right? When people say, oh, well, what do you do, Nisha? And you're like, I am a lawyer, right? Mm -hmm. and that probably feeds into a lot of things. So not only did you give that up, but you also had to basically tell your parents, I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore. Yep. And I'm sure that, that that was probably difficult for them. So can you yep. talk us through that a little bit? Yes, uh, definitely a more difficult series of conversations than going vegan. <laughs> I feel like going vegan was like, okay, that's that's kind of weird. Well, whatever. Sure. Hey, uh, this prestigious career that you worked really hard to get me to, I just no longer fits me, you know, like that was definitely a dif more difficult conversation, uh, especially because my parents are immigrants from India. They, you know, worked their entire life to 
helped me get to where I got to, you know, made so many sacrifices. Uh, you know, just for instance, like in high school, my mom drove me twice a week, my senior year to an SAT prep course because it was the best one. We didn't like live in a great area where we could have access to that stuff. And so she would drive me two hours one way twice a week to go to an SAT course so that I could do really well on my SATs. That's just like one example of a type of sacrifice they made. And so because education was so important to us, both to my parents and to me growing up, I think that like when I came to the decision that being a lawyer was not the path for me, it felt very confusing to them. I think it felt hurtful. I think it just was like, well, now what? Like, what do you, are you lost? I think they really thought that I was just lost and like looking for something. Uh, and so there was a period of time where it was definitely difficult for them and def difficult for me to explain to them because it's well, hard. it's like basically like mom and dad, thanks for all your help. Um, I'm just going to go follow my passion now. Right. Like it's, it sounds like very frivolous. Mm -hmm. Uh, but over a few years where, when I got to the point where I was like, I'm really happy. Like I'm doing something that I enjoy and I'm getting meaning out of it. And I'm no longer feeling constantly anxious and miserable. My parents were like, Oh, well, what we want for you is to be happy. So like, if that's what you, that's, if that's where you are in life, then like, this makes sense. Like, and now I don't know if, if you've seen them on my channel, but they make regular appearances on my YouTube channel and they're the biggest fans, biggest supporters. Oh. So you know, it's a lovely full circle story. Just took mm -hmm. a little bit of time. And do they, do they get what it is you do now? Yeah, 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 they do. They do. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're on my, they make appearances on my channel. So they know that like I make videos and I develop recipes and, yeah. um, you know, and they understand and have embraced that you can, this can be a career path. You can't yeah. living doing this. Yeah. So you're, you're in a very unique strat uh, stratosphere actually really with, you know, your, your following and what you've created. It's pretty, pretty spectacular. Thank you. The fact that you've written written books, you've got this. Your your brand is called Rainbow Life. Is that right? Rainbow Plant Life. Rainbow Plant Life. And how'd you come up with that name? I think when I first went vegan, I was just astounded by how colorful a vegan diet was. You know, like once I stopped like having chicken breast at the center of my plate or whatever it was, I was like oh my gosh, it's so colorful. So that's the rainbow. The plant is, you know, the vegan. And then life was like, this is not a diet. This is my lifestyle. This is how I live my life. And I live my life, uh, I hope, abundantly, colorfully, like with joy, with vibrancy. And so it just felt like a nice hit. Yeah, yeah. So you have a, a new book that's coming out next year, which yes. we're not going to talk about <laughs> um, um, unless you want to, but I'd love to have you back on the show in a year. Yes. When So we can show that off. But you also wrote a book several years ago that I, I do want to talk about it. Yeah. Because I think that there's great value, great value in the book that you wrote and how everybody's life can be improved by following a lot of the tenants that you subscribe to in this book. And I'm going to hold it up now because I've been teasing it a little bit. <laughs> and it's this, it's called the vegan Instapot, right? By Nisha Vora, wholesome, indulgent plant-based recipes. And this has been authorized by Instapot as well. Yes. And I want you to know that I have so many people that I know that rave about the Instapot. Do you know who <laughs> J is? I think you cut out for a second. Do I know who chef AJ chef AJ no, is? I don't think so. Okay. Well, anyway, she is a vegan chef, uh, whole food plant-based and she just raves about it. I actually have an Instapot sitting in my closet. I, I, I hear that from a lot of people sitting in the closet, sitting in the garage, sitting yes. in the laundry room. Yes. And so I want you to inspire me and the other 5,000 people that are listening right now that mm -hmm. have an Instapot and they're not using it to, to pull it out of that closet or garage or pantry and use it. And, but first tell me, how did you become enamored with, of all things, the Instapot and then to do a whole book on it? <laughs> yeah. So I started using it because I was working as like a busy lawyer and I didn't have that much time to cook. And What's, what I'll say about the Instant Pot is that it doesn't necessarily save you that much 
time overall, but it does save you on active cooking, right? So like you, it still might take 45 minutes or an hour, or whatever it is to complete the meal, but 30 of those minutes, let's say you don't have to be in the kitchen, right? Like that's a huge time, like, I don't know, like getting time back, right? Like time is one of our most precious assets in, in this life. And so 30 minutes back in your everyday life, I feel like is a big deal for a lot of people. And it was for me. And so I started using it as like, oh, I can like prep something on Sunday night in the instant pot, but I don't have to stick around in the kitchen. Maybe I can like sit on the couch and have a glass of wine with my partner. Or maybe I can do a quick, you know, workout. Maybe I can go like down to the pharmacy and pick up all the things I need to for the week, you know, like little pockets of time. I felt like I was getting back, which I think is really, really valuable. Uh, and so that's how I started using it. And I started sharing some instant pot recipes on my blog. Uh, some, and that was what, but did somebody I mean? introduce you to the instant pot or did you just, I mean, how uh, did you first decide I'm going to actually purchase an instant pot? That's a good question. I don't think anyone was like, hey, I'm an Instant Pot fan and I think you should really try it out. I think it was becoming very popular at a certain time. And I uh, was like, I like to cook. Let's let's try it out. Yeah. And I, I do think the first six months or so, it kind of sat unused because I wasn't sure where to begin. And I think it was probably like I had a, a short break from work. And I was like, okay, let's let's open this up, see what what it's all about. Well, so let's start with where do we begin? Where do you yeah. recommend that people that have an Instapot or actually want to buy one, where do we begin on this Instapot journey? Okay, so what I will say is don't think of it as this like crazy complex machine. It's actually very simple. And there's one function you will use more than anything. So even if it's like nine and one, you're probably mostly going to use the pressure cook function. And so don't let the fact that you could be using nine different functions intimidate you. Um, if you know how to press buttons and close lids, it's actually very simple. Uh, in the introduction of the book, I go through like all of the main buttons and what you might use them for. And so there's like instructional stuff at the beginning if you feel like you want someone to walk you through that. Um, so I would say just like, don't be intimidated by it. It's not like a complex, confusing machine. You just have to actually unpack it and like be willing to be like, okay, let me finally use this. And the first thing you can make like can be very simple. It can be a pot of beans. It can be a pot of lentils. You don't feel it. Don't feel like you need to make like this complex, right. uh, you know, Indian curry in the instant pot for your first time breaking it in. You can just add some lentils, water, salt, and call it a day. And, and 10 minutes, 20 minutes later, whatever it is, you'll have cooked lentils. Well, the, rea the reality is I didn't, I mean, I thought you used an Instant Pot for rice, oats, beans, lentils, and that was it, right? And seeing your book and the fact that you can make casseroles, lasagnas, every, mm -hmm. every dish that you could absolutely imagine you can make, or the Instant Pot is part of that. Yeah process yeah. to me is, is absolutely fascinating. It's like you, you and me looking through this book and seeing what you've been able to do, it's like opened up a whole new, like fantastical world for me that I didn't even know existed. Yeah. I mean, I think it is very useful to do things like beans and lentils. Like, especially if you are someone who eats a wholesome plant-based diet, you probably eat a lot of beans. You probably eat a lot of lentils. You probably eat a lot of whole grains. And so it's nice to be like, Oh, I'm just going to put my beans in the instant pot, walk away. Like you don't have to stir them. They're not going to burn. Um, and so that's, it's a great use for those things. Uh, I definitely went through a period where I bid, did a big pot of beans in my instant pot every Sunday religiously. And that was very helpful. Um, but it's also useful if you want to make soups, stews, curries, you know, as well as other things like that we can chat about. Um, oh, oh I'm, I don't you even start. <laughs> I'm going to go through uh, probably 16 to 18 recipes. Oh, and, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So hang on to your hats. <laughs> I, I have, I have uh, some friends that have three Instapots and they have them yeah. all day long. And one they've, they've got like rice, one oats, one beans. And you can, at any point in time, if you're hungry, you just open it up and, you know, <laughs> Later, your ladle, uh, ladle into a bowl, whatever you're feeling like. It's really cool. Um, so I feel I feel way left out, especially after looking at your book. <laughs> um, 
So let me ask you this with just the basics, like the grains, oats, rice, beans, is it just like, do you have to follow a certain protocol? Like, okay, three cups of water with one cup of rice, close the lid, press the right button, and then you walk away. Basically. Yeah. Um, in the intro, I also have some charts for cook times for certain grains and certain beans and lentils. But basically like you can zhuzh it up, you can jazz it up if you want, but if you really just want to keep it basic, you can just do your grain or your bean and water. Yeah. You can add some salt, you can add bay leaf, you can add some spices and peppercorns, like you can add things. Um, but as soon as you seal the, the machine, close the lid, you push a button, you set a timer for however many minutes you need, and and then you do walk away. It's it's very convenient. So, have you heard the phrase that it takes like ten thousand hours to be like completely incredibly proficient at something? Have you spent ten thousand hours with the Instant Pot? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think anyone needs to spend ten thousand hours with the Instant Pot to like understand how it works. It's a it's, it's pretty it's pretty easy to use after the first three times, you know, yeah. the first couple of times you're like, ah, oh, did I press the right button? Did I seal the machine properly? But, but I think it gets easy yeah. very quickly. So before I dive into some of these recipes, is there a certain approach to cooking that you'd like to share with, with our audience? Um, cause you know, we're for the most part, the plant strong, uh, audience, you know, we're, we're not a fan of added oils. We want to keep, you know, refined sugars to a minimum. We're a huge fan of whole grains, um, you know, things of that nature for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I do cook with oil, so I'll say that, but what yeah. I would say that I think is often missing and can be a huge asset to your cooking is our spices and herbs. So, um, if you don't eat oil, like what I would recommend is to buy whole spices and then grind them yourself with like a mortar and pestle or a spice grinder and just adding freshly ground spices to your food can like really just take your food to the next level in a way that I think a lot of people don't think about. And they're like, Oh, it's another step, but I promise you it's one of those steps that's like high impact. Um, and what, then herbs. What, what, okay. Okay. Yes. Oh, no, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say with, with, with spices and herbs, cause you mentioned like are there like five key spices that you recommend every kitchen should have? Oh, that's such a hard question because it's like often cuisine dependent. Um, but I will say what definitely. You? What about you, your kitchen? Uh, for sure, cumin and coriander. I cook a lot of Indian food, but you can also use those spices in like Mediterranean cuisine and Mexican cuisine. So like yeah. definitely those two. Uh, turmeric is great because it's, you know, it's, antioxidants. It's got that beautiful color, but I would say, uh, one of the mistakes I see often is not, is using too much of it. You really don't need much. Like I've seen people use like a tablespoon of it in a recipe and I'm like, it's Very just going to taste like turmeric. Tastes um, like earth. Like earth. <laughs> yes. So oh. go easy with it. Yeah. Um, I love any sort of chili flakes. I, if you can handle a little bit of heat, I feel like it brings this complexity and character to your dishes in a way that um, I think is often missing. Sometimes I'm like, this just needs a little punch or a little kick. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it can be just your standard red pepper flakes, but there's like a whole other world of chili flakes that I love to, to experiment with. Um, I mean, there's so many, I, I no. don't know if I can. No, no, that's them. good. That, that, listen, okay. that's good. Stuff. Okay. <laughs> you've, you've done exceptional. Uh, and then I would say fresh herbs are such an amazing addition to your diet, both from like a health perspective, they've got lots of nutrients and antioxidants, but they add so much like character and dimension and obviously freshness that I think is often missing. Um, and sometimes people are like, oh, can I just use dried herbs? If you're making like a hearty stew where like you're not going to really notice the difference between, let's say, fresh oregano and dried oregano. Sure. But if you're making something that's on the fresher side, less of a um, really like cooked, slow cooked dish, like I think they do so much, um, especially like, for instance, it's summer right now, if you get fresh basil from the farmer's market, like oh. that alone can just make whatever you're eating. If it's a salad, if it's a bowl of lentils, it can just make it taste so much more exciting. And so um, I really encourage folks to experiment with fresh herbs and spices. Yeah. Are you a fan of cilantro? Yes. I don't think I could be Indian and and, <laughs> and not like cilantro. I think that like genetic intolerance, like where it tastes like soap for some people, I think it just skips over Indian people. Like I don't, I don't Absolutely. know anyone That's who's not... Indian who can't have cilantro. Yeah. Um, 
you one of one of so you in your book you have like nine different uh, tenants one of them is um begin with aromatics and so in in an instapot you can actually um as you're going along you can actually dry saute right yeah yeah so there's um you can basically treat the pot the inner pot um as a as like a pot like a pan or a saute pan you right. can saute your onions you can add your carrots you can add your spices um and then you can, whenever it's time to add, let's say your beans, your final ingredient, you then pressure cook it. But you can do a lot of sauteing before you get to the pressure cooking stage. And, and so when you're sauteing, can you adjust the heat just like you could like a gas, yeah. gas ring? It depends on your model. It's not going to be as like uh -huh. as fine-tuned. Like you're not going to have like 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. But depending on the model you have, there will be like a low heat, a high heat, and um, like a normal heat. There might be like five levels. It, there, it really varies depending on the model you have. But yeah, you can lower the heat um, or increase the heat as needed. One of your uh, uh, pillars too is, uh, or, or I don't know what you want to call it, uh, your nine approaches to cooking is to deglaze as you go. What does that mean exactly? So when you deglaze the pan, whether it's on the stove or in your instant pot, you're basically adding kind of like a thin, flavorful liquid to scrape up all the brown bits. So when you saute, let's say an onion and some garlic, you'll notice there's like some little brown stuff stuck to the pot. That's where a lot of flavor lives from the mm. onion and the garlic or, or whatever aromatics you're using. And so you want to scrape that up with your liquid because it's going to go back into the liquid and that's going to make the, the whole dish um, more flavorful. So you're like, if you're not deglazing, you're missing out on some of that flavor. But also for the Instant Pot, it's super important to deglaze because if you have a lot of stuff stuck to the bottom of your pot and then you go to pressure cook it, it will probably, not always, but it will probably trigger the Instant Pot's burn sensor. And so it might you might get that annoying notice that says burn. And your food's not necessarily all going to burn, but you won't be able to continue cooking it. You'll have to open it and stir and then, you know. Yeah. So do you have, so speaking of like aromatics and deglazing, what are your favorite aromatics that you'd like to have in the house? Um, well, so I think the most basic two onions and garlic I use so often. And so I think those can start be a, can start off a dish super flavorful. Um, I also really like shallots and leeks, which are part of the kind of onion family, but have a little bit different, milder flavor profiles, especially love leeks in winter when they're in season. And then again, I do like to do a lot of Indian cooking. So in addition to garlic uh, and onions, I also really like ginger and green chili peppers. So that's what I kind of refer to as the the holy quaternity of Indian cooking. So many dishes start off with an onion, ginger, garlic, and some sort of green chili pepper. You also say, don't forget the acid. What do you, mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? Um, talking about acidity, not drugs. So don't worry. Um, <laughs> well, the, you know, I, today, uh, you know, acid isn't, doesn't come with such a bad label, but okay. Right. Right. <laughs> it might be used for like mental health treatment, you know, who knows? Right, right. Um, but I feel like oftentimes when a dish feels flat or a little bit underwhelming, or just like there's something missing, some sort of acidity can like lift it up and give it that perk and that and that little zing that it needs so the easiest yeah. yeah the easiest thing would be like you made a pot of soup and it tastes a little flat squeeze of lemon juice at the end a little bit of red wine vinegar de mm. depending on the flavor profile it might be balsamic vinegar or champagne vinegar um it might be lime juice like if you're doing like a mexican dish or an indian dish or a southeast asian dish lime juice might be better than um lemon juice um and oftentimes it's really just at the end that you need it. Sometimes it's nice to layer it in in, the, in in the earlier stages. Like sometimes I might add a little bit of Dijon mustard to something while I'm cooking. Um, but yeah, it's something it's sometimes, sometimes during cooking, but oftentimes just at the end. And it's really just a small amount to just pick everything up, make it taste a little fresh. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for me to dive into the book? Yes. Fantastic. But I do want to start by saying, I love your, your dedication, right? You yeah. dedicated this to your to your mom and your dad for your unconditional love and believing in my dreams. Yeah, isn't it fantastic when your parents, you know, they have your back? And, and best feeling, isn't it? Isn't it? And I'm telling you, with everything that I've been through, 
um, and the unique path that I chose. They they never shot me down. They never tried to steal my dreams. And yeah. was, it was super, super important in, in the voyage that I've taken. And so when I see, you know, your dedication and what you've been through and the path that you're on, it's um, it's it's really exciting for me to see. Oh, that. that's nice to hear. So, yeah. So let's start. Uh, this is under the sauces and dips and okay. page 53. And it's your restaurant style hummus. Yes. Three varieties. And the reason why I'm bringing up this one is, you know, for, for vegans, hummus is such a fantastic condiment. Yes. It and, is. And, it, and I tell people, if you can learn to make your own hummus, you know exactly what's in it. Cause we're, yeah. we try and stay away from all the, the oil and a lot of the processed stuff. But what I want you to talk about here is not only what, what part of the hummus are we making in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, Instapot, but also you talk about the secret to achieving the creamy texture is the baking soda. Yeah. Right? And so, and, and something about the skin of the chickpeas. So will you talk to me? Tell yeah. Us. So the part that you do in the instant pot is the, you cook the chickpeas. Uh, I've made hummus, you know, from scratch for many years and you can definitely make it with canned chickpeas. It's still going to be better tasting than store-bought stuff. But if you want like the best texture, smoothest, hummus and the best flavor home like dried chickpeas that you cook from scratch is the way to go and obviously with the instant pot it, you can just pop your chickpeas in the instant pot you don't have to like stir them on the stove check them for doneness so that's the nice part and then you just add your cooked chickpeas and tahini and a couple other ingredients to your food processor or blender um and the baking soda you add to the chickpeas while they cook and it helps to soften the chickpeas more quickly and also helps to like remove more of the chickpea skins. Mm. And so in an ideal world, you would peel every single chickpea skin off to get the smoothest, dreamiest hummus. Most people aren't going to do that. And the baking soda doesn't remove all the skins, but it removes a lot of them. So you do get a nice benefit from um, having a lot, a lot smoother chickpeas basically. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a really nice trick um, tip. All right, I'm going to move on to breakfast right now. All right. Basic steel cut oats. And the reason is because I I could live on steel cut oats every <laughs> morning. I find it's just such a great foundational uh, plant strong meal. And this is your photo in the book that's absolutely gorgeous. Did you do all these photos? I did, yes. Wow, you say that so nonchalantly. <laughs> well, just because now this book is four years old and I personally, you know, harsh critic of my own work, I'm like, yeah, these aren't, this is not up to my standard at wow. this point. Wow. But at the time I was like, you know, very much proud of, of the work I did. Yeah. But that's when you work in a field like this, like the goal is to improve as you go on. So, you know. Totally. Well, uh, mm, I can't believe how gorgeous they are. And you've got a peaches and cream. You've got a chocolate peanut butter banana. That's the one that I would try first. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously a spiced apple walnut oatmeal. But any anything you want to say about this recipe or uh, like steel cut oats typically take, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes. Is that what it is in the Instapot? Um, it's a 12 minute cook time, but you do have to wait for the, that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier is like, yeah. you don't necessarily save time overall because it takes some time for the instant pot to come to pressure. And then for most things, you have to wait a little bit for it to depressurize, maybe 10 minutes before you can open the pot. But what you do gain is like the, you don't have to stand in the kitchen and stir. You can like leave the kitchen if you would like while it's cooking, while it's coming to pressure, while it's depressurizing. Um, so I don't know if you would save that maybe five minutes, you might save um, 10 minutes at the most. Um, but it's nice to, you know, if you're making it in the morning, you want to get ready for work, you want to squeeze in a quick workout, you want to, you know, prepare for the day, like you can do all of that and not be in the kitchen while your breakfast cooks, yeah. which I think is pretty great. Do you like your oatmeal thick or thin? I like it on the thicker side. Um, yeah, not too thin. Yeah, I do too. I like it. Like I like it to feels walk. more substantial. Yeah, I'd like to walk on top of it if I could. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, all right. So this next thing, it's like you got to be kidding me. You got a breakfast enchilada casserole, on, and that's right on the next page, seventy-seven. Right there, it is. Look at that bad boy. It is gorgeous. And you actually make that in the Instapot? 
yes, you do need a basically like a glass round Tupperware to put it in there. Um, but like you don't have to buy a specific pot for that. You sh it's like a it's a seven cup glass round dish. So like I feel like a lot of people will have that at home. But basically you layer it in there and then it kind of does its thing. It kind of steams and cooks in the instant pot. I mean, I love enchilada casseroles. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and so based upon what you know, like looking at that, how many people would that feed? Uh, says four to six, okay. but you know, serving sizes are suggestions. You know, everyone has a different appetite, different set of circumstances. So. All right. Um, all right. I, I also, I, I used to, I mean, I have been eating this way now since I was 23. So a little over 35 years. Yep. I used to love French toast, you know, and obviously French toast, you typically put what, like an egg glaze on top of it. Right. But you have a, on page 91, you have an overnight sweet potato French toast. And so, again, in the Instapot, I'm making French toast made from sweet potatoes. Yeah. Well, there, there is bread in there. I don't know if you um, eat bread. I do. Um, so, I do. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, but, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at it. Um, you, it's kind of the same principle as the the casserole is you put it inside of a dish and then it kind of you add a little bit of water to the instant pot below. And so it kind of the water creates the steam necessary. So then it cooks that way. Um, but this is a nice option if you um, like, let's say, have a holiday get together where oven space is a premium. But maybe you want to do a holiday brunch and you're like, oh, well, I can make this in the instant pot because maybe someone has something else in the oven, hopefully not a Turkey, but you know, sometimes oven space is at a premium. Yeah. I'm moving on. We're, 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 we're splitting out of breakfast. We're going to satisfying sides. Okay. We're going to start with the lifeblood of India, which is, <laughs> which is doll according to you. Yes. I want you to know Nisha. I just got back from a seven day Alaskan cruise Cool. And on the vegetarian section, they had a doll that I gravitated towards every dinner. I yep. loved it on top of jasmine rice. And I, I, it made me realize how one of my favorite dishes in the whole wide world is doll. I think I could live yeah. doll. It's, right. it's such a comforting dish that is also really easy and really wholesome. And traditionally, Indian families will make dal in a pressure cooker, not in an instant pot, but in a traditional stovetop pressure cooker. So um, it's like very fitting that it would be in this book. And it's the dish that I ate for dinner so many nights growing up. My mom made so many different variations of it, but usually there was some sort of dal along with rice and roti and um, some sort of vegetable. And that was like a very that's a very classic Gujarati dish. Gujarat is a part of India that my parents are originally from, and it's you know it's just all naturally vegetarian, naturally vegan. Um, and so yeah, I eat a lot of dal now as an adult too, just because it reminds me of home and it reminds me of like childhood. Well, and I love the way you say here, um, it's not just the bean, but it's also the spices, the herbs, and the aromatics that transform it from the simple to the exquisite, from the humble to the extraordinary. Yes. And it's so true. Yeah. Um, love that one. And then I just want to go to something. This is another really basic one, and it's just free holies on page 129. Mm -hmm. You say Mexican-style pinto beans. But yep. Here we go. You can see that there. Um. Any special trick here? Like I know you you talk about some flavoring agents that you use here, like jalapenos, onions, garlic, chili powder, and cilantro. <laughs> I mean, I think what's great about these is that they're so versatile, right? Like you, if you're a beans and rice kind of person, if that's like a, a go-to meal for you, okay, you can put these with rice. If you want something a little more special, you could put these in tacos. You could put them in a burrito. You could make your own enchiladas with these. You could spoon these over tortilla chips and do the vegan um, cheese sauce in the book and have like nachos. So I think it's like one of the great things about the Instant Pot, like I was mentioning, is you can whip up a pot of beans 
by spending 10 minutes in your kitchen, walk away. And then you can use those beans in like six different ways during the week. Like if you're a busy person who likes to eat beans, that's like a, that's a pretty great gift mm. to have. Are you a fan of asparagus? Yeah. When it's in season, when it's not in season. No, <laughs> I think, I think asparagus is officially in season right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, um, I feel like it's probably at the tail end of its, its yeah. season, but if you've ever had asparagus in like October or something, it's not well, worth buying. Here, right here on page 149, we have your lemony asparagus dish. And when you cook asparagus in the Instapot, are you putting it with water in there or how are you doing it? Yeah. So um, you do basically you, the instant pot comes with a, it's called a trivet. It's like a little metal rack. And okay. so you can use that as a steamer or you can buy a steamer basket that fits in your instant pot. And then for really quick cooking vegetables like asparagus, I actually use low pressure, which is um, most of the things you're going to pressure cook will be at high pressure 99% of the time. But occasionally if there's something delicate like this um, that you don't want to overcook, I use low pressure. Mm. All right. I, yeah, I love grilling asparagus out on the grill just in a couple, you know, a couple minutes. You just got to, do you use a basket so they don't fall through the grates or? Uh, I usually, believe it or not, I'll take out a skillet and I'll just. Put oh, okay. That's skillet. good. Yeah. Nice. For the most part. Um, all right. Next, I want to go to page 165, which is your sweet and spicy braised red cabbage. Mm. I do like this one a lot. I don't eat enough. I personally don't eat enough cabbage, especially red cabbage, but I'm really drawn to the colors. Yes. And, and cabbage, you know, because it's a cruciferous, you know, uh, green leafy, I think. Um, I just want to eat more and it's so affordable. Right? So I, I think cabbage is one of the most underrated foods. So affordable. Like even in high inflation times, cabbage has still got your back. Uh, very obviously nutritious for you. And it's so big too. And it doesn't go bad after a while. Like I often will find a cabbage half in my fridge from two, three weeks ago. And I'm like, I think this is still good. Like it, so most people aren't going to use an entire large head of cabbage in one day. Yeah. But the nice thing is it's probably going to still be good in a couple of weeks. Um, this particular dish I think is so fun because I don't, well, one, it's very colorful and pretty. Um, but also I think like when you eat it, it doesn't feel like you're eating something so healthy. Like, oh, I'm eating a huge head of cabbage. It's got a little bit of crunch, but it's soft. It's got some tang and acidity. It's got a nice like juicy pop from the dried cherries. It's got a tiny bit of heat from the um, red pepper flakes. Um, it's a very fun way to eat cabbage and very, and very easy to make. Mm, your description of that was exquisite. <laughs> and you also say here, this dish is also incredibly beautiful like an edible bowl of ruby toned jewels. I stand you're, by it. You're a good writer. You're <laughs> a good writer. <laughs> well, something paid off at, at law school then, I guess. <laughs> yes, indeed. And, and you said uh, your cabbage might be good, you know, for two or three weeks. Uh, I think I found some that are, have been good two or three months later. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely possible. It yeah. has a, it's nice shelf life, budget friendly, good for you. It's, it's got a lot going for it. Uh, so, you can see I'm a huge fan of kale, right? I'm wearing my one of my <laughs> yes. kale shirts right now. We recommend people eat, you know, three to six servings of some sort of green leafy a day. And here on page one, 167, you've got citrus, kale, and carrots right here. And I love that combination too. Mm -hmm. uh, anything you'd like to say about this dish? This one I think will surprise you. It doesn't... I don't know. It feels, it doesn't feel like kale in a way that, I don't know, some people don't like. Like I love kale, but I know it's not everyone's favorite. It's got this nice sweetness to it from the carrots because once the carrots are cooked, they get sweeter. And also there's a little bit of orange zest and juice. And so I think like the unexpected slate sweetness just makes it feel like very fresh and fun and uh, not so kale like if that makes sense and you're a fan of the dinosaur kale as opposed to the dinosaur kale i, I mean i'll eat both yeah. um but i if i'm just buying like regular kale from the grocery store i will go for dino kale i think it's less um chewing on my mouth well yeah it's a little bit less unwieldy or yeah a <laughs> little, little bit less attitude um 
Let's go to comfort food favorites. For those of you, because I, I, I don't think I said it, we just left vegetables. So we're <laughs> going to comfort food favorites right now. And I'm going to start. And and how many recipes do you have? Do you know? In, in this I book? think there's 91 in here. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. And we're just, we're just hitting some high notes here. But uh, there's a dish that I love. I love a good risotto. Right. But I find it really difficult to, to, to nail it. And I have one in my first cookbook, the engine Two diet and it's good, but it's not fantastic. And so that's why I'm drawn to this one. It looks mm -hmm. fantastic. What can you I do? Me? I do love a mushroom risotto. So I started making mushroom risotto when I was 19 in college, I took an Italian cooking class and we did a new dish every week. And one of the ones we did a particular week was mushroom risotto. And I was like, this is like the best thing ever. You know, this wasn't vegan. It was, you no, know, yeah. just a standard Italian cooking class. Um, but I remember being like, I'm going to be making mushroom risotto for the rest of my life. Like uh, not every day, not, not even like that often, but like if I want like a special meal and some, the person I'm making for, I know they like mushrooms, like I'm going to be making a mushroom risotto. And I think one of the intimidating things for some people with risotto is that you have to stir it often mm -hmm. for like 30 minutes on the stove with the instant pot. You obviously don't do any stirring once it's pressure cooked. So that's nice. And you still get a, quite a nice texture. There might be a slight difference between a stove top cooked risotto and a instant pot risotto. But I think for 99% of people, it's like still going to be like, wow, I made risotto and it wasn't very challenging. Well, and you, you say here too, in your um, description, that you learned that the secret to creamy risotto is not butter or cheese, but the starch in the rice. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, and the savory quality. Interesting. Um, all right. <clears throat> so one of my favorite comfort dishes in the whole wide world is a shepherd's pie. And you have a lentil shepherd's pie on page 191. And you, you too say this is one of the ultimate comfort foods. And... Uh, you also recommend in this dish, here, everybody, look at this photo, that a little red wine goes a long way in this. Mm -hmm. Talk yeah, I find that red wine, especially with lentils, for some reason, there's just this really symbiotic pairing. And the lentils, if you, de like we talked about deglazing earlier, um, you deglaze after you've sauteed your onions, your garlic, whatever it is, add a little bit of red wine, deglaze the pan, cook it off until you no longer smell wine, three minutes, five minutes. Yeah. Um, I find that once you add the lentils and you cook the lentils in that mixture, they just taste like almost meatier. Um, and for a lot of folks who are coming to a plant-based diet and maybe miss meat and miss the familiar flavors, like a little step like that, if it's going to make your lentils taste meatier and like help you to enjoy that experience of a shepherd's pie, like I think it's worth it. It might not be worth it for everyone, but um, I'm always looking for little things I can do to bring back the familiar flavors and, and textures that people miss from, you know, animal based foods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next dish we're going to move on to under comfort foods, I think one of my signature dishes that I make is what's called raise the roof lasagna, <laughs> raise, the roof. raise the roof lasagna. Cause it's that good. You have a vegetable lasagna with a basil ricotta that, absolutely looks like it would raise any roof <laughs> there there it is right there and again look at the shape of that right that that is made in the instapot i'm fascinated yes uh, um so and it's used you insist that you use no boil lasagna noodles too right yeah i think that like with this particular recipe and also with the instant pot you want something that cooks quicker you don't want like the the wavier noodles um those probably wouldn't cook through here but i think what i love about this recipe is that the ricotta it takes like five minutes to make you add a block of tofu to your food processor with five seven other ingredients and it very very much tastes quite cheesy it has those lovely savory umami cheesy flavors that you expect in a cheese. And again, it takes 10 minutes, five, 10 minutes to make. 
And it's also really versatile. So if you were like, oh, I don't know if I have time to make lasagna, you can use this ricotta and dollop it on your grain bowls. You can spread it on toast. Um, you know, it's very versatile. And so I think even if you don't end up making the lasagna because maybe you don't have the right pan to put it in your instant pot, the, the ricotta is definitely like a, a staple to keep in your, in your, can in your, in your fridge. And what's, what's my total, do you have it in here? Like what's my total cooking time on this? You think? Um, I don't have the cook times in this. Let's say, so the ricotta will probably take you 10 minutes. And then once you assemble it, it goes into the instant pot for 20 minutes. Wow. That's it. Yeah. Cause, cause I find <laughs> my, my vegetable is the raise the roof is a labor of love. I mean, we, I we, mean lasagna <laughs> is, is, you know, it is, it is, it's work, right? Yeah. But we figured out shortcuts by using just like all frozen, you know, pre-cut veggies and, you know, there's those short, nice shortcuts and there's no noodle that I don't use any longer that I never pre-boil anymore. Right. I just yeah. throw it in, make sure I get enough sauce that it can. Yeah. yeah. If your sauce is, is going to cover it enough. Yeah. yeah. You should be good. Yeah. You hanging in there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. We're rounding the bend, rounding okay. the bend to, the, to the barn here. So let's go to soups, stews, and curries. Um, this time of year, I probably in the next in the month of July, I will probably eat sixty ears of corn. Yes, so, <laughs> I love fresh corn, especially on the. It's grill. so good in the summer. It's so good, and it's so cheap. So, so cheap. I don't no butter. I just eat it like plain. Um, but you have a best corn chowder on page 241. Should I make really that? Good. Is this, is this worthy? I think it's worthy. Um, I don't know if you do you eat coconut milk cause it has coconut milk in there. Well, we're not huge fans of coconut, but what we'll do instead is we'll take like oat milk with a coconut extract. Oh, um, okay. Which kind of is a nice simulation. I think also, um, you could do, I don't, you do cashew cream as a nice substitute, I think, um, for oat milk because it has like the creaminess, but it doesn't have yeah. the, the coconut milk. Um, but this is like, uh, I personally love this one. It's so creamy and it has the flavors of corn with a little bit of heat from the jalapeno and um, it gets additional creaminess from some Yukon gold potatoes that get blended into that. It has a little smoked paprika, so it's got just a slight smokiness. Um yeah. You know, I personally love it. And you recommend to get a, like an added burst of flavor to take the corn cob with the husk on and put it over an open flame, right? To kind of give it a little bit more of a, that's under your tip. Yes. And, you, yeah. you get that like slightly smoky charred flavor, which I think is, is obviously, I don't think it's delightful. So I, I know in almost any dish that I have where I'm using corn, I, try and buy fr uh, frozen roasted corn. I find the flavor yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, frozen cor corn is great when you don't have access to fresh corn. Like you can definitely use it in this recipe if it's November and you're like, oh, I could go for a corn chowder, but you can't find fresh corn. It's, it's still quite good with frozen corn here. All right. I'm moving on to page 259. Your butternut squash chickpea. Is it, how do you pronounce it? Tagine? Tagine? Tagine. Tagine. Yeah. yeah. There she blows, right? Wait, <laughs> where is it? Oh, I somehow, uh, there it is right there. There you go. And that looks phenomenal to me. I want it right this second. Um, <laughs> and you say while you prefer using dry chickpeas for the best texture, you can make this dish with cooked chickpeas. Yep. Um, yeah. Any Anything about this dish that um, is impossible not to love? I think what's really fun is the spicy pickled raisins. So they add um, like these little juicy pops of sweet tanginess that are so fun. Um, I also would say that this is a pretty customizable recipe. So if it's not, if you don't have a good butternut squash, like really any winter squash would be fine. Sweet potatoes uh -huh. would be fine. Pumpkin would be fine. Um, the recipe calls for kale, which I know you love. But for instance, if someone listening doesn't like kale, you could do baby spinach. Um, there's like just different opportunities to kind of customize it to your taste, which is fun. Mm. All right. We're going to, we're going to uh, move on to desserts and we're just going to talk about two. And these are, these are two of my, two of my favorite desserts in the whole wide world. 
And one is chocolate, but you have a double fudge chocolate cake on page 281. Yes. That, that looks sensational. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, you made that in an in Instapot. Yeah. So the thing about that is you do need a smaller cake pan, like a standard eight or nine inch cake pan won't fit in most instant pots unless you have a really big one. So if you want to do baking in the instant pot, you do kind of need to buy a separate cake pan. They're not like expensive or anything, but that's just something to keep in mind. Something interesting about this recipe is you'll notice it comes with a raspberry topping. Yeah. And the reason I came up with that, I love chocolate and raspberry, but I remember serving this cake to a friend when I was testing recipes and he had like a four-year-old child at the time. And the, the child was, and I had served it just chocolate cake with the raspberries, like fresh raspberries. And the, the child was like, I really like it, but I want more raspberry. And I was like, you know what? You're right. It could use more raspberry, like that nice tart balance to the rich fudgy chocolatiness. And so that's fun fact on how that ended up with the raspberry. Yeah. Really, uh, Cooking tip from a four-year-old. Very useful. And you say that this cake is one step removed from eating pure fudge. Yes. With, <laughs> uh, I can't remember the last time I had fudge, but I miss it. Um, all right. This is it. I just actually had this dessert, not out of an Instapot, but I had this the other night. And that is Thai mango sticky rice. Maybe my favorite yes. all-time dessert. Just Same. Just something about it that just hits every... Every, um, every flavor profile that yep. I, I could I possibly want in my it's mouth. It's sweet. It's tangy. It's a little tart from the mango. It's salty. It's creamy. It's got chewiness. It's you know juiciness. It's really got it all. It, it, it does. <laughs> and do you have a favorite mango or that you recommend using mm. here? You like the uh, the honey. Yeah, the the honey mangoes are the probably the best option that you would get in a supermarket. Um, they're in season usually from February to August, so definitely in season now. Um, personally, if you have an Indian grocery store, uh, Alfonso mangoes, which are only available basically April to June, yeah. fantastic, phenomenal. Um, I yeah. generally uh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> oh, I generally avoid like those larger red and green ones. I not Tommy even Atkins. Tommy Atkins. They're fine, but I think they're probably the most basic yeah. variety of mango and they're a little bit more fibrous. So especially with the dessert, um, uh, a smoother mango is nice. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's, that's all for now. As far <laughs> as me putting you under the gun with your recipes, <laughs> way to go Nisha with those recipes. Incredible. Um, so tell me, what is it? today that you're really sinking your teeth in and you're super excited and passionate about and doing work that you Nisha love? Yeah. So I spent a lot of time with my YouTube channel, basically teaching folks how to cook plant-based food, vegan food at home. And that gives me a lot of joy. Um, I went vegan for ethical reasons. And so whenever I can get, you know, someone to eat fewer animals, even if it's not like they're going vegan overnight, that brings me a lot of joy. And so I am super excited that my job is basically to teach people how to become better cooks so that they can feed them themselves, they can feed their families and in the process, you know, eat fewer animals. So that's super exciting to me. And I'm just really fortunate that I get to do that every day or yeah. not every day, but you know, as part of my regular work. And you've got a new book coming out next year. Um, I'm sure you've probably come close to turning that in at this point. Uh, I submitted it on Tuesday. Fantastic work. Yes. Yes. That is so great. Yeah. Can you give us any kind of a little teaser as far as like what it's about or anything? Yeah, it's a definitely a more comprehensive book than the first one. It's not an instant pot cookbook. And it's more just like my approach to vegan cooking and like all the different things, techniques, flavor profiles that you can use to really build more flavor in your meals, build more exciting textures and just like little things you can do to enjoy your food more. Um, whether you are, you know, a lifelong vegan, not a life, like most people aren't lifelong vegans, but whether you're a long-term vegan or someone who's just dabbling in plant-based um, cooking and wants to learn more and wants to eat more plant-based, but not really sure how to make it taste as good as they, they would hope to, it would taste. Yeah. Are you a one, a one woman team or do you have anybody that works with you? 
yeah, I have a few employees. Um, I have a full-time recipe tester who actually her last day is today. She's moving back um, to the East Coast, which is sad, but she's been with me for two years and has helped test all the recipes that we've done over the last two years. Um, my partner, who I mentioned earlier, he um, works full-time on the business as well, doing more of the like a lot of the behind the scenes stuff, a lot of operations and strategy. Um, and then I have another assistant who does a lot of stuff online. And then we have, you know, more like independent contractors, like who will, my video editor or um, my writer or things like that, where like I might be doing some of the stuff, but they're doing like they're focusing on like specific niche. Totally, totally get it. So to have over a million followers on YouTube, you know, that's quite a, uh, quite an accomplishment. Do you have a certain strategy as far as like how much content you're trying to put out on a weekly, monthly basis? No, I should. Um, but for me, it's never been about the numbers. It's certainly sure. cool to see, oh, I have a million followers on, on YouTube. Um, but for me, it's more like, how can I create the best content for my audience that's useful, that might be inspiring or engaging or entertaining? And so I don't produce as much content as I would like maybe in an ideal world, but that's because I try to focus more on like the quality. And um, if something doesn't, I don't get it the right the first time, I'm going to redo it. And I'm going to spend a lot of time planning out what do I want this video to sound like and feel like, and like what information do I want to deliver in that? Um so I don't have a, I don't have any like target. So give me an idea frequency. though, for example, like what your last YouTube video that you did, is that something that you thought up with a couple other people? How long did it take? And sure. Then, yeah. Um, the YouTube videos, my partner and I generally plan out in advance, um, sometimes a week in advance, sometimes a month in advance, sometimes a couple of days in advance, really kind of depends on what else is on our plates. Um, but we, we met in law school actually. And so we both have, I would say fairly analytical approaches to a creative space. And so I think that can be a, both a good and bad thing, but in general, I think it's helpful for us to think about, we'll plan out, okay, like how do we want this intro to sound and like what's the what are the main talking points we want to convey and like how do we want this video to feel do we want it to feel more casual do we want to feel more of like you know not like a movie but like do you want it to feel like there's a lot of different you know b-roll clips going on and people are like moving from scene to scene um or do we want it just to feel like it's live cooking with nisha kind of thing and so we'll think about those things and plan them out then we'll film then I'll get all the footage to my editor. The editor will send me our first draft. We'll review it together. We'll look at a second draft and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned your partner. What's his name? Max. Max. And so you and Max, you guys knew each other, did you say, in law school or at the law firm? Yeah. We met in law school a long time ago. Wow. And so did he go the the, the, the lawyer route for a couple of years too? And then is, did he... Did you like drag him away from that or? No, he, he left first. He only did it for two years and he was like, yeah. I'm out. Um, unlike me, he did not go to law school with this like grand ideal of helping people. It was like he graduated at the height of the financial crisis and was like, I think I should do something stable, like become a lawyer. And then once he became a lawyer, he was like, this will not work. <laughs> so he started working at a tech startup um, just a couple years after um, being a lawyer and then eventually kind of moved into working with me as my business started to take off. And as the pandemic honestly started, I was like, you're home, help me do this, help me do that. And soon enough, you now work with me, <laughs> work together. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a blessing and sometimes it can be a little tough, but yes. Yes. I would agree with that on both fronts. Yeah. How hard is the LSAT? Oh gosh, well, it's been many, many years since I have taken it. Um, in suits, which I'm watching, in suits, yeah. you know, this guy would take tests for people that couldn't pass the LSAT. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, like any standardized test, like if you learn kind of the approach of the questions and the style of the reasoning that you need to get down, I think you can learn it and do well enough standardized tests in general, I think aren't a great indicator of how, you know, 
how good of a student you'll be, how good, like, obviously I'm not a lawyer anymore and might've done well in my LSATs, but like <laughs> didn't make the best lawyer because I stopped being one. Whereas there are plenty of people who probably didn't do as well, but are really hardworking and committed to, you know, what are they doing? So like, I, it's kind of. Well, yeah, in, in suits, you know who Meghan Markle is? She's like. Yes, I do know that is. Okay, I do yeah. know who that is, even though I haven't watched the show. She plays this paralegal that just can't take standardized tests for a mm. Right. And then this guy that's so good at him basically teaches her, just like you said, there's a, there's an approach, there's a mentality and, and I'm sure she's going to pass. I, I'm, yeah. I'm not far enough along. We'll see. Who knows? <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. So Nisha, where, I know we've put up some of it, but I want you to say it. Where can people go to find you, learn more about you, you know, um, get connected with you? Yeah. So if you are the kind of person who likes to watch videos and learn from videos, I would check out my YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash rainbow plant life. Um, or you can just go to the YouTube search bar and type in rainbow plant life. Cause, um, while I'll do recipe videos, um, I always teach you other stuff in the video. So like if I'm showing you how to make a stir fry, I'm also telling you why you should cut your tofu this way or why you should season your tofu this way or why you should cut your vegetables this way. I'm giving you like little tips along the way that I hope will help make you a better cook, even if you're not making that particular recipe. Um, if you are just looking for recipes in a printable format, you can go to my blog, rainbowplantlife.com. All of my recipes live there. You can print them out using the print button. Um, and then if you like to use Instagram, you can find me on Instagram as well. Rainbow plant life. Fantastic. Well, Nisha, I really appreciate your time today. Congratulations on, um, doing something, working with something that you're passionate and that you love and, uh, and finding that path. It's yeah. so, so absolutely cool. Thank you. It was great to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Can you give me a, uh, a plant strong bump on the way out here? Wait, wrong. I'm there. going to the wrong. A little higher, a little higher. There. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Thanks. Nice to see you. Thank you so much. Next year. Next year when the, when Definitely. the drops. All right. Yes. Thanks. Rainbowplantlife.com is the home for all things Nisha Vora, including recipes, blogs, and links to her other social media channels. It is so amazing to follow these up and coming Brock stars and I can't wait to have her back on the show soon to talk about her latest and greatest book in the meantime keep it colorful keep it flavorful and always keep it plant strong thank you for listening to the plant strong podcast you can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts leaving us a positive review and Sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Kryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.